It's Dave here from Salt Sport and Life Training, and we welcome you to our uh, live stream where today I'm going to be talking on the topic of drugs and alcohol. For those who don't know, uh, my name is Dave and I'm the founder of Salt Sport and Life Training. We're a not-for-profit health promotion charity that work in sporting clubs, and many of you have heard the story of how we began, but for those who haven't just very briefly Back in 2013 and 2014, I actually visited seven football clubs around the state who had um, lost people they loved to suicide and in every case said the same thing generally, and that was we never saw it coming. And I wanted to start a charity or a health organisation that would get people talking before the event about some of the blind spots that um, were obviously existing in our culture. In this case, it was in regard to people's well-being, mental health and, you know, situational, um, you know, um, problems that they were facing. But also, I think there was some uh, important um, blind spots in regard to uh, drugs and alcohol. And that's one of the ones I want to talk about today. So I do invite you to be active in the chat and I'll try and keep my eye on that and be able to answer questions or, you know, bring up some of the points that you make as well as we go. So um, I'm going to tell quite a few stories today. I think you'll find it quite interesting, but each of the stories has a purpose. I'm, I'm very convinced that if we're going to attack this issue, we do so in a very positive sense and we build upon some of the current um, ways that people are already thinking and, and just build upon who they want to be and what you know, sort of club or society they, they want to have. Um, and so I'm going to start by telling you a story um, about a club that I went to. Before I do though, um, you know, this lockdown time has um, indicated that for a lot of people, they're, they're really struggling. And I just read that research tells us now that there's been a 12% increase in alcohol consumption during lockdown. And that typically people, when they come out of lockdown will continue this level of drinking uh, when they re-emerge into the community. I think often alcohol is the go-to remedy uh, for many things in our society. And so um, back in the early days, just not long after I'd started Salt, I got a call to go to a senior football club. I got a call on the Monday from the president of the club because what had happened was that um, on the Sunday, the day before the, before the juniors could come out and play their games on the early morning, um, there was a lot of um, broken glass and um, there was litter from a social event that the senior club had had on the Saturday night. And the president and some of the senior committee were were really angry that um, the kids' sport had been interrupted because of this and because of the tone that it set with the parents. And so they rang and they said, can you come and do a salt session for this club on the Tuesday night? And so the players turned up thinking that they were going to have training. But in actual fact, they had this salt um, session around drugs and alcohol. And so I started off uh, talking about you know the dangers of drugs and alcohol and the influence that the playing group was having on the next generation of kids coming through. And as I was talking, I was interrupted by a guy who said, Dave, we hear what you're saying and it, and it all makes sense. Uh, but the fact of the matter is we just like getting pissed on a Saturday night. And, and so, you know, he, he kind of said it like, you know, this is the way it is, like save your breath because there's something going on here that overrides all your good arguments. And I said, uh, well, that's OK, but you're going to have to own who you are. What you are is an excellent drinking club but what you're not is an excellent football club. And I said, hand up if you want to be an excellent football club. And they kind of reluctantly put their hands up. Uh, and I said, hand up if you'd rather be an excellent football club than an excellent drinking club. And, you know, they kept their hands up again. Uh, and then I said, so hand up if you think that this behavior is okay. And reluctantly, they, they put their hands down. And we went on to establish that sometimes there are sacrifices required to become an excellent club. And over a period of two years in working with that club, they did go on to become an excellent club. They formed leadership groups. They changed the way they ran their social events. They appointed somebody in charge of, of marketing and they marketed their club as a healthy club on and off the field. And their sponsor numbers grew significantly. Their playing lists grew, their profits grew. They started winning more WAT matches and they won something even more important than that, I think, and that was the respect of the community. 
And I think if we're going to challenge culture, we, we need to do it positively. And we need to pick up on some strongly motivating beliefs that we already hold. And, and um, you know, in this case, it was that this club wanted to be excellent. And I think most of us do. I think we default to being average or worse than that when we're not challenged. But given the choice of excellent or mediocre, most of us will want to be excellent. And I think also there's another really strong force at work, and that's um, this idea of respect uh, and respect versus popularity. I'm going to tell you another story. In fact, I'll tell you a few stories. Um, I was at another footy club uh, with a group of under 19s, and I asked, who's the biggest drinker in the room here? And it was interesting because they all pointed to a guy over in the corner on my right and his name was Paddy and they were all laughing. And it wasn't that Paddy put his hand up and said, I'm the biggest drinker in the room, but he was obviously quite happy with the kudos and the laughter and the popularity that that brought. And I said to him, tell me, how much do you drink, Paddy, if you go to a social event, how much do you drink? And he said, oh, look, probably 12 cans. Maybe I bought a couple more, maybe 14 cans. And everybody kind of laughed because he was this 18 or 19 year old who was you know, filling his body with so much alcohol, but, you know, he obviously enjoyed the status of that. And I said, put your hand up if you don't drink at all. And there was reticence. And I looked around the room and very gradually, only two boys put their finger up. They didn't actually put their hand up. They put their finger up like not wanting to be noticed. And I said to one of them, tell me, tell me, Johnny, why uh, don't you drink at all? And this boy at the back of the room, who I'm just calling Johnny now, says, well, look, um, I play TAC Cup, as it was known back then. Um, I want to get into law at uni. And my friends and I, we, we just don't need it. We have fun without it. And I said, put your hand up if you respect Johnny for that decision. And every hand went up. And I said, Johnny, have a look around the room. Uh, I said, you were reluctant to put your hand up. And, and yet you've got the respect of the whole community for having done that. I said, put your hands down. I said, now, boys, Put your hand up if you would rather be popular than respected. And not a single hand went up. And I said, hand up if you'd rather be respected than popular. And every boy raised their hand again. I said, so we've got Paddy over here. He's very, very popular. But we've got Johnny up the back. And he's actually very, very respected. And every single one of you said you'd rather be respected than popular. And yet Johnny was scared to put his hand up. He only put his finger up. Somehow he was embarrassed. And I said, why? And we started to talk about some of this stuff around masculinity where we think that we've got to behave a certain way, but actually we've probably been sold some kind of cultural lie here because it's not really who we want to be. There's one other concept that I want to bring up, and it's this one about intergenerational responsibility. So I went to a, a country football club right up the top of Victoria, and it was kind of the footy and the netball club where were the biggest attractions of the community. And so when I came to talk about drugs and alcohol, there was a great big crowd of people that gathered there. And when I walked in, there were kids just running everywhere. There would have been 30 or 40 kids. And, um, and, and people had brought meals, casseroles, and it was a beautiful atmosphere. And, um, you know, we all ate together beforehand. The kids were running around. And then when I began to do my talk, they herded all the kids into a hallway and somebody went out there to look out for them. And I started the presentation by saying, you think that I'm coming here to talk to you about drugs and alcohol, and we will talk about that, but that's not the onus of the night. I want to talk to you about these kids. Uh, and I said, what kind of club do you want to be? What kind of influence do you want to have on these kids growing up as they come into your club? What sort of reputation do you want? And where do, do drugs and alcohol fit into all of that? And of course, this was the conversation of the night, that it was actually all about kids. So I want us to just reflect upon these three measures that, that I used, but also just reflect about drugs and alcohol for a minute. And I know you wouldn't have signed in to hear about, you know, drugs are bad and alcohol is bad, and this is the, the damage that it does. And I'm not actually going to labour on that. We don't when we do our courses. But I'll just remind you of a couple of things in case you might have forgotten or you might not know. Alcohol is a contributing factor in around 5,500 deaths in Australia every year. Now, we've just gone through COVID and, you know, we've looked at the number of deaths, but 5,500 deaths, one in eight deaths of young Australians is attributable to alcohol. In suicides in men, 51% had substance misuse as a significant stressor. And some researchers have just recently said that alcohol reduction at a population level is 
possibly the most effective male suicide prevention intervention. Big words there. But what it's saying is if we can reduce the amount of alcohol that males drink, it's probably the best thing we can do in regard to suicide prevention. Alcohol abuse contributes significantly to the crime rate, the divorce rate, the rate of depression, anxiety. And from a physical health perspective, it basically harms every single organ in our body, especially our brains, especially in our kids, because we know that the earlier that they start drinking, the more impact it has on their forming brain and particularly um, on, on attributes of, of, of their short term memory. So if this was any kind of disease like COVID, uh, what would we throw at it to stop it from happening? But is it possible that as a society, we've just kind of become blind to the damage of the risks? And why is it? I mean, is it because this is what we've always done? Uh, and are we going to just assume that we're always going to do this kind of thing? You know, we do a drug and alcohol session with parents. And sometimes I hear them say, I don't like the kids going on schoolies and I worry. But what can you do? It's just what they do. It's just what kids have always done. But does it have to be this way? Um, as far as men is concerned, I think there's still a real pressure to see binge drinking as part of their acceptance and popularity. Uh, alcohol companies have done a, a very effective job in matching our perception of masculinity, particularly with beer. And we've seen the ads that associate that your manhood is associated with how much you can drink. I mean, psychologists have put a lot of work into investigating where are our um, you know, sort of feelings of weakness as men and how can we adapt our product to making men feel more accepted in, in their manhood. So how do we approach all of this? I think we do so in a really positive way. I think there's real hope. I think everything we do has to be framed in the positive. If ever there was a generation of young people who are willing to question the wisdom and culture handed on by the previous generations, it's this one. If we think we can't change culture, think again. As an example, smoking in kids has more than halved between 2001 and 2009. And for drinking, the average age of trying alcohol for the first time has risen from 14.7 in 2001 to 16.3 in 2019. So actually kids are drinking less. Now there's still a large proportion of kids who um, uh, will binge drink or, or a proportion of kids who, who will binge drink, but that has actually um, uh, reduced the amount of kids binge drinking, uh, not as significantly, but actually the um, age of kids um, who've never been drunk um, between the ages of 14 and 17 has gone from 39% to 73%. So the, the number of kids who've, who've not got drunk has increased significantly between that 14 to 17 year old age group. Um, it's well known that the highest causal factor of problem drinking is the earlier they start, the more likely they are to develop a lifetime problem with alcohol. So the further we can push back the age of that first drink, which is pushing back, is really significant. And the notion that introducing kids to alcohol early in life, that this will teach them to drink moderately has been absolutely and clearly debunked. That technique does not work. So I want to, again, build a really positive narrative here. At SALT, we think you're going to get far much more traction if we start talking about healthy living really early and build on that position in kids as early as we can. And there's a really great question that we can ask our kids or we can ask in any sporting club. And that is, who are you when you are at your very best? This is a great question. And they won't say that's the version of me when I'm drunk. Um, if people from a young age recognize that potentially they're strong, courageous, resilient, enthusiastic, honest, trustworthy, caring of others, their behaviours are going to tend to match their self-perception. Now, kids typically don't think this way, but it's what they show when they play sport, all of those attributes. And the whole positive psychology model says identify those strengths and apply them more widely. We need to help our young people recognise who they are when they're at their very best and to live to that version of themselves consistently. And living to your values consistently 
is absolutely linked to good mental health and not doing it is something that our kids suffer by being a different version of themselves depending on their you know social groups and it's it's right at the heart of them feeling inconsistent and not liking themselves another crucial factor as i suspect you know is the friendship group Show me your friends and I will show you your future. Our research at SOT, when we do our live quiz, shows clearly that if a kid's friends are using alcohol or even illicit drugs, then they probably will too. So we hear about this thing, you know, peer group pressure, and we associate it with the negative, but it can actually be a force for good uh, as, as well as for, for bad. And sporting clubs potentially can apply a lot of positive peer pressure. They already do it on the field in terms of those expectations. They can do it off the field as well. When you look at senior clubs, and particularly those hyper-masculine ones, the cricket clubs, the footy clubs, I, I think that we see a larger proportion of people binge drinking than the rest of their community. And in fact, when we look at the statistics, it is, it's much larger, and they think that that's kind of normal life, but actually reflecting back that in normal life, most people don't actually binge drink. They might, some of them, for a period of life, but most of them grow out of that because they recognise the advantages of not binge drinking outweigh the disadvantages. So imagine if this could change in our sporting clubs, if they could be as consistent off the field in terms of the health messages as they are on the field. And I think it's going to change. I think that COVID has allowed us to reflect upon who we're going to be when we come back. And it's going to be the clubs that can say we are a healthy club that's going to attract the sponsorship, the more limited sponsorship now than, um, you know, looking to an old way of doing things. Um, Another really important thing is having a game plan. Now, when we play a sport like basketball, coach calls us off, uh, re-evaluates the game plan, changes it every five minutes. In footy, we change it every you know, half an hour. But often we don't actually change it for life very much. We absolutely need a game plan for life. So what's your game plan for life? And where do drug and alcohol fit into that? Where does respect and equality fit into that? Where does having an open conversation when you're struggling fit into that? If you start asking kids, we do this in our sessions at the age of 12, 13, 14, about what their response is going to be to alcohol when they're offered or illicit drugs. They say this, I'm not going to drink till I'm fully mature or I'm not going to drink at all. And they say, and I'm never going to use drugs. We get them to on a continuum from one to 10. They have to walk and, and, you know, where do they stand? And then we say, somebody's going to leave this group. What are you going to do? And they practice pulling them back in. You know, this type of commitment made at an early age may not lock things in for life. We know things happen when they're 15 or 16, but it starts a process of conviction that many people will carry with them into their teenage years. They'll make a decision. They'll hang out with a good and positive group and they'll say, I'm going to be respected over popular. Uh, I'm going to live my best life. I've got this plan A, which I want to stick to. If as parents and as coaches, we can build up our kids and focus on their character and less upon their talent and their sporting achievements, then our kids are going to go, this is what my parents or my coaches really value, who I am, my consistency of character, that it's my character that really matters. In working with young adults, we've learned that Often, alcohol is this gateway drug to other drugs. If we ask in a club and we do, why did you start using illicit drugs? We'll hear this as the most frequent answer, that getting drunk was becoming a little boring. It was a bit same, same every week. And then somebody suggested that we step it up. Let's um, you know, use some ecstasy or some cocaine or something else. And that's what led to the drug addiction. It was a decision made under the influence of alcohol. Not always, but, but often. So I think it's really, really important that we remove the sense of expectation at social events that we have to be drinking alcohol. The guy like Johnny puts his hand up when we say to him, how do you feel about going to a footy club social event? We'll say, well, it's not that people don't accept me, they do, but I just feel a little bit out of it. And actually, when it starts becoming about the alcohol and less about the people, um, it, it kind of loses its enjoyment for me. What if we could make people the focus? not alcohol the focus. Um, I think that would change things. I, I think in multicultural communities and communities that are trying to attract women and children and people who are not into the whole hyper-masculine space, they're going to be far more attracted to that social event that some people are already attracted to, but, but many are not. I think we need to be more creative around celebrating achievement 
Alcohol is the go-to reward. We win a premiership. We finish year 12. We have a big birthday. And it's like we deserve to get drunk. Can you imagine if instead a celebration meant we go surfing, we go fishing, we run, we mountain climb, we play volleyball, we listen to music, we dance, we sing, and we come out feeling stronger and better for the experience. At the end of the day, we're exhausted. And we sit around, we have great conversations in front of the fire because we're exhausted. Uh, but we don't actually have to be drunk to have those conversations. And I reckon COVID's given us this chance to reimagine what local clubs could be like. You know, we started in footy, and I've always felt that it's unfair that footballers get paid to play while gymnasts and cricketers and netballers and basketballers and swimmers pay for the privilege of participating. And many footy clubs now are going to find it really difficult to pay their players. And in the past, the idea was, well, we sell a certain amount of beer to pay, to pay our players. And we don't like it, but actually we've got a monthly contract with an alcohol supplier and we get our beer cheaper if we sell a certain amount. And so we have to encourage drinking and we run events where it's a a huge entry price and it's all you can drink and we, you know people feel compelled to drink because they paid for it but there's an alternative let's run events with good food and entertainment and alcohol served in moderation and women and families attending and let's disrupt this whole notion that boys will be boys and that's the way that we do things and we have our, our events with just the, the boys you know being kind and of, kind of dumb about their behavior and so in conclusion, I think COVID has given us a chance to reimagine how we do things moving forward. We don't have to go back to the old ways. We've had a better than ever chance to reflect on new beginnings and what they might look like. And people are going to come back with a degree of social anxiety when they come back. And alcohol is not going to help that. Uh, but real conversations will. Um, at Salt, we're loving the fresh perspective that lockdown has given us to reframe tomorrow so that it can be better than today. So thanks to everybody. I'm just looking at uh, at, at the, the, the links in here and we've got some uh, some comments coming up and Steph's in our, uh, our, our room there. So uh, she'll have been answering some questions along the way, but, uh, and she's put up a resource with Beyond Blue there. So um, thanks to everybody who's participated today. And um, love you to go to the SALT website to uh, check out what we do, um, to have us come out and talk about our Reconnect course, our Reemerge course, uh, any of our courses, including our, our drug and alcohol course. I want to thank our sponsors, MTAS, um, Melbourne Total Abstinence Society, for supporting us along the way to do what we do, and also um, Bendigo Bank, who are our foundation sponsors. To all of you who support the work at SALT, I want to thank you very much. Thanks for that and bye for now.